a sunny Friday evening. I uh, expected a little bit more people, but security is probably not a topic for everyone. Um, so I want to talk about big data science for security. Um, by security, I am working on, in the Joseph Russell Center for Unified Threat Intelligence and Targeted Attacks. Sounds very exciting. Uh, you see the logo FH St. Pölten, uh, University of Applied Sciences, St. Pölten. So St. Pölten is uh, 60 kilometers to the west of Vienna, 23 minutes by train, so that's faster than if you go across Vienna by public transport. So St. Pölten is not that far away, and I'm faster uh, in St. Pölten than my, my work than uh, a project partner in Vienna. But, uh, what, what do we have to do with security? So this is the University of Applied Sciences in St. Burton at night. Uh, unfortunately, we, oh, we are growing. We are having not enough space. So actually, I am not in the main building. The IT Security Research Institute is in the building on the other side of the photograph. And the top floor on the farthest away from the main building because we IT security researchers are dangerous. So we are far away from the other ones. Uh, but what can you study with us? So the two-minute introduction from the marketing department what the University of St. Paul is actually doing. Uh, we have six departments in different subjects. One department, one department is the computer science and security department. And you can study with us. Uh, so traditionally, uh, we've been teaching the bachelor in IT security and the master in information security. If you're interested in this, I have to ask for each of these here. But new, 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 we also have a data science and business <coughs> analytics uh, course since last year. So this is the bachelor currently. We have currently don't have a master in that, but maybe one day we will also do a master in data science. Uh, so if you're interested, if you want to do, uh, want to study data science and business analytics. Uh, six semesters, data science basics, legal stuff, IT stuff, practical, special thesis, whatever you choose, and international uh, project semester. Uh, I also have to mention, because here are all data scientists, I suppose, uh, we are always looking, because we are running this study program for opportunities for corporations, uh, guest lectures from companies, excursions to companies, data sets from companies that we can use in lectures for the students so the students don't have boring uh, uh, artificial data sets uh, would be nice or bachelor thesis with real topics internships student projects so there's a large opportunity of cooperation uh, with companies if you want to, to, to interact with us please talk to us um, something new or something brand new the fourth uh, option when you want to study with us in our department. We are studying now a master in advanced research and innovation in computer science. Uh, this is a master course. It is taught in English and there's only 12 seats. It will start hopefully pending accreditation by EQ Austria uh, in autumn. But it's basically a study program to study how to do research, how to do science, how to do applied science. So the idea is, uh, half of your study time is you learn how to write scientific presentation, foundations of science, how to do design innovation, how to write a paper, how to apply for funding, whatever. And the other half, you're actually always working on a research project, uh, on a real research project. So you get the theory and the, and the practical uh, experience of working in a research project while studying already. So this is a new uh, study with us, new master course, if you're working on a uh, research project and in a, in a company mm -hmm. and you want to learn how to do this science stuff, research stuff. So maybe you're interested in this and, and because it is in English, foreigners can also apply. Uh, if you're interested in, in this, please think about it now because the info days are in the next soon and you have to apply 
and the selection we only have 12 seats, there are still open places, but if you want to do this, or if you know someone who wants to do this, please forward this to the people who want to know. Okay, that was the short introduction. Uh, why research at the applied university? Uh, usually you would uh, think applied universities do only teaching, because we are not universities, we are applied universities. But uh, St. Bernard is a little bit of an anomaly because we have a dedicated research department uh, where we say we want to do uh, research projects so we can have direct practical experience from up-to-date topics, up-to-date problems, and students can see that and students can profit from the experience. So you see here on the cybersecurity, IT security, data analytics, and visual capabilities, uh, the list of areas we are doing research in is much longer. Just look at the homepage. But in the area of cybersecurity and IT security, if you zoom in, there is the Josef Breffel Center target, finally. Uh, this is the project I am currently working in. Uh, this is a five year focused research project, 2015 until next year, 2020, funded by CDG. And as an academic research partner, so as the creative partner who has the ideas and does tries the new wild concept is uh, University of St. Burton and the industry partner is Cybertrap, like uh, one of the uh, project partners. Uh, this is a small company here in Vienna who uh, tries to do uh, new things in IT security and, and malware detection, malware protection. And to try new ideas, it's usually uh, hard for a small company to, to pay for high risk research and uh, maybe there is no return on investment so the idea was born to make this as a funded research project so the company pays a little less so we can try uh, higher risk research projects which may work out or may not work out. Okay, what is target doing? Uh, Unified threat intelligence and targeted attacks, uh, thinking about how to detect uh, new kinds of attacks or targeted attacks uh, from this agent of attacks, assessment, detection, evaluation. So there are multiple work packages within target. I am speaking today <coughs> only of one uh, work package <coughs> which I am mostly involved in, but there are also other persons working in target with a little bit uh, different topics what I am showing today. So the initial research question uh, at the beginning of target, what this work package was, well, malware is a constant threat. We know that the internet uh, produces malware around the clock. And this is a problem because everybody is connected to the internet and you always get new and new and new stuff. And the basic question on the long running question in security research is how to detect and analyze and analyze for new and malicious activities and programs. So how do you detect malware today? Um, the easiest way is I already know what the malware is. So I do an exact identification. I already know this binary is malicious and I somehow fingerprint it, make it a checksum, make a large database of these checksums and I just see uh, is this the malware? Is this executable the malware before I start it? Problem is, of course, I already have to know that this program is bad. And I need a large database of this stuff, and this does not help me with new attacks coming from the internet. Brand new attacks. So the second approach is, well, I write a set of rules, which is suspicious behavior. Um, because malware behaves in a certain way, and so I hope that when an expert thinks about this, how good programs behave and bad programs behave, I can set up some rules uh, and catch when a program misbehaves. Of course, uh, this requires an expert, and an expert's, expert's time is expensive. So this means costs, and it has to be maintained. And it is guessing, and it's probably always incomplete. So for a practical example, uh, this is state of the art. I have rules what's good and what's bad behavior. And for example, there's a rule, a process name, and it's in this temp directory of the operating system, and it's an exe file, 
executable files within the dev directory should be considered dangerous. Maybe this applies for your server or machine you're using, maybe not. <coughs> so it's an interesting idea to say, yeah, executables should not be started from the dev directory. It should, should be always started from program files because there are the installed programs. Or another rule is uh, a file has been renamed to be an executable. So it has any file name and then I renamed it to one of these extensions. So this may be a suspicious behavior. And you get long and long and long lists mm -hmm. of these rules and hope one of these rules catches when something interesting and new on the system happens. So the <coughs> third way uh, to try to identify the malware is um, to let the program run and see what it's doing. So you run the program in a basically a sandbox environment. You monitor what the program does. And after some time, if you don't see any bad behavior, think, OK, this problem is, program is probably OK, and distribute it to a wider audience. So famously, uh, if, you, if you know it, there was uh, in the Google uh, App Store for Android, they did this approach with this bouncer applications. So they let every application run for a few seconds, and it got monitored. And if it misbehaved, the bouncer threw it out of the app, uh, app store. Right? Of course, somebody found it out, found out uh, that you can use it to phone home. So that's how they detected it. And the easy workaround is if year is 2019, I'm a nice program, and if year is larger than 2019, 19, I start to misbehave. You can see it from the outside. So just let it run for a few seconds. Is, is it really a good assessment or not? Okay, so that's the state of the art. Let's think about this problem a little bit. The optimistic assumption with this problem is um, when an attack happens on the system, he wants to do something. So he does something. He does some operations, he opens some file, he creates some processes. Uh, so uh, there is some noise. An attacker triggers when, when he takes over the system and searches for some data and accesses the data and transports the data away he wants to steal. He has to access files, he has to trigger some network traffic. So something is happening when an attack is happening. Mm -hmm. um, so if a system behaves differently, whatever it is, um, there may be a new kind of attack going on, so it should show up if you monitor the system and record what system events are happening. Yeah, okay, that's a plan. So, the problem is, is it possible to identify and match good events over multiple systems and say this is base behavior of normal operating system behavior, but if we remove the, the identified good behavior of good system events that we see everywhere, only anomalies <coughs> remain, so unique behavior on the system, and maybe these are attacks or maybe because this one system behaves in, one, uh, in a different way for some other reason. A human has to look at it and say, okay, there, uh, something happened here, but no, nothing happened here, it's okay. Okay, let's think about this. From this initial question, we actually have not one uh, problem to solve, but we have four problems to solve. Uh, first problem is we need data. How do we get the data what is happening on the system? Second problem is we have a large uh, pool of data. What do we do with the data? And everybody working in data science knows raw data, you have to somehow pre-process it, clean it. But it's nice data that you can feed to your algorithms. Uh, the third question is the actual research question is now is it possible to see in this event data when malicious stuff is happening and, and to see this is normal behavior and this is malicious behavior and of course the fourth problem because we're working with the company partner in this project uh, sometimes when uh, the, the end goal would be to use an algorithm that works to move it actually into a uh, production module to actually deploy it in the field to get this working out uh, in the real world so for the first problem uh, Data capture, how do you get uh, a capture of what is happening on the system? 
Um, if you want to monitor malware, well, you probably want to look what uh, processes are running on the system, uh, what process starts another process, what files are accessed by running programs, <coughs> network connections are open, closed, is what data is transferred. Uh, and if you really want to do a monitoring system, where not just one program, but all programs running on a system, uh, you have to do this uh, near the operating system core, so ground level, you have to write a collector, and this is actually non-trivial work. So you can pour a lot of resources into that to make this stable, because it's not so easy today. Uh, we don't have a single core system, but we have dual cores, quad core systems, and every, all cores can do stuff at the same time and how they are transferring data. Uh, so that's non trivial. We did not do this. Uh, our project partner, Cybertrap, wrote this collector and provided us with the collector for this kind of data. How does this the scenario approximately work? So, with the Cybertrap installation, you have some servers in the production network. You install uh, either you monitor directly a machine or you install some interesting, we call, it's called DERS, that um, distract the attacker to uh, separate systems where they can do whatever they want but don't hurt the production. And these are then monitored, these so called uh, decoys, and the events, what is happening on the system is then collected. Uh, into the database, into analysis, and end up in the cyber dashboard for further analysis. Approximately. Uh, but basically, you install collectors that monitor what's happening on the system. You don't want to do this on real production servers, but more on separate servers. Uh, if you succeed in that, and then and do an analysis with that. What does raw capture data look like? approximately like that. So this is very simple explorer access start start, start with outlook exe by user thomas explorer access start with chrome exe and user thomas and then write to user thomas cache chrome user data of course the browser has some intermediate files and then he starts from local IP to remote IP and connections. So this is basically the raw data that is captured. If you want to see what, if there's unusual behavior of processes on the system, you have to closely monitor the processes, of course. Um, is this now a good or a bad thing? Okay, you get now a real-time uh, data feed of what is happening on the system. You get basically millions of security events per host. Uh, you want to get this real-time feed and store it into a database, but at the same time you want uh, to replay these event streams to then analyze it later. And of course you have to do this while you are upgrading the software or do you want to upgrade the database. So it's a fun implementation problem. Uh, if you think about performance, uh, computer computation and power you need for that, as you are recording what is happening in the system, it's sensitive data and companies usually do not want that you stream this data to some cloud servers on your favorite cloud provider. Uh, they rather want it to keep in-house uh, everything uh, for data protection reasons. So if you are thinking, well, I throw some computational power on this for analysis, no. Uh, only what's locally available and what will be provided by the companies and what's reasonably payable. So on-premise solutions are usually preferred, usually. Uh, and the second problem, obviously, uh, there's the European Union General Data Protection Regulation, which says use processing, distribution, storage of personal data requires consent. And since we are monitoring very closely what's happening in the system, do we capture personal data? Yeah. What the options do we have for a pre-processing of this raw uh, stream of the system events? We can delete or remove user-specific data. Uh, we can replace the user information with pseudonyms. We can encrypt certain data. We can hash, uh, one by hash, sensitive information. We can add random noise to the data or 
be a square numbering bit, so there are multiple options here. Um, so for example, we have this raw capture data uh, that I already shown you, and we could replace Thomas with his one guy from marketing. And there are multiple guys in marketing and we don't care who it was, but it's good enough, it was one from marketing. Or we can say we encrypt the network address and we don't care about the address for now and maybe we need the address later and then we can decrypt it again. So we had a discussion, what is the size of the user group? So you do all the users from marketing into one group and you do all the developers in one group and you do all the maintenance, whatever in the group or then what's the best group size? I don't know, depends on the scenario. And if you encrypt the piece of data, so for intermediate for protection while this processing is done, uh, maybe it is compliant with the law, uh, maybe it is not because the information is just hidden and someone still has a key to decrypt the data. As an IT security statement, the guy that asked, of course, who has the key and how it is kept safe and can you prove it to me? Okay. Uh, hashing, one way hashing of data, cryptographic hashing, you throw in array of bytes into a cryptographic hashing algorithm, you get a fingerprint and of course from the fingerprint alone you don't really know what originally was the site. It's a one way function so it's not reversible, but of course if you have the same input you get the same hash results, so even if you have multiple users if you see they produce the same hashes of the connections, you know they are going to the same side. If it's a popular site, okay, but if two users go to some exotic or rare site, you see this user goes there and he goes over there. It's a compromise. So we have some, pro some profile, for example, user Thomas and user Manfred, what he's doing. We anonymize this the username and the network connections and oh, we are still seeing the process but we need the process name because we want to detect malware so we <coughs> want to keep that that was Firefox exe or it was Chrome exe or it was Outlook exe the problem <coughs> is uh, if you look at this you can probably still guess who, who was the user even if you anon anonymized it <coughs> because Someone prefers Firefox and the other user always prefers Edge. And usually when I when he comes in in the morning, he starts Firefox first, then he starts his Outlook, then he starts his Word. And the other user always starts Spotify, listening to music, then he starts his browser and he uses other tools. So it's still even if you have the process names and just the, the, the sequence what it's called, you can probably uh, come back and identify what, who was the user. Uh, so you have all funny things you can do, uh, typical execution, uh, call of execution of programs in the morning, start up from software use patterns, websites exist, revealing file names. Uh, uh, if, if you collect the data, you get millions and millions of accesses. So as a human, you can look into the data for 100 files, for 1000 files, but you cannot really check all 1 million files accesses for interesting file names but sometimes you uh, notice file names for example the computer name is in the file name because it was a log file or you don't know this before when you start such a project you get a byte of data then you start to dig around and you find new corner cases and edge cases yeah we should have thought of that uh, it's not trivial uh, now that we know about this, uh, we started last year another research project which will go over three years, uh, which works with uh, things about this problem. So, how can you anonymize data and still do something with the data? Because if you anonymize data, you will have a kind of information loss. And to really quantify this, I, uh, I anonymize. Bit and a little bit further and a little bit further and when starts data to become unusable and when it's still usable. So a colleague of mine is now working on this project and it's just started 
but as we are aware of this problem, there is still a lot of work to do. Okay, we have some data. We have the data pre-processed. We have its state in the database. And then we want to detect, detect this model, these anomalies that are happening. Then we thought about what do we actually want to detect in this data. So we have basically two cases we want uh, to see when there are uh, new programs started and if uh, programs that are already known or well known and usually running behave differently. So the idea is, I think I have it, no, okay, let's show the next slide. Um, for example, you have uh, in your company a web server front end. You have two web servers uh, for redundancy, and one web server serves all the requests coming from even uh, IP addresses, and the second web server serves all requests from the odd IP addresses. So over time, you can argue that they are serving the same pages uh, to all the people, but if one web server starts to behave differently, which is not happening on the second web server, uh, and this, this is an anomaly. So what is here on the graph, on the x-axis, this is basically the events counter, this is the time, and on the y-axis is uh, new files accessed, basically. So that's the length of, of, of the file name of new files accessed. So in the beginning, a lot of new files are delivered by the web server, but over time, uh, the new files are only temporary files because they are randomized file names, so they're created always new. So here you see one peak, because here someone broke some money, started via PHP uh, shell, uploaded somehow, started it somehow, and this is the case, this system behaves differently. If you compare to other systems, would you guess what these are? I'm showing this picture since two years, but it's uh, the picture uh, which usually is the best understood picture. Uh, this is Windows Update. <laughs> so Windows Update runs uh, every second Tuesday every month. And this is the update. And the large update uh, consists of multiple small packages. And all the individual uh, updates are actually updated in a random order mm -hmm. but at the end of the day uh, every PC should have run the same updates so uh, you will one PC will start updating in the morning so if you do a comparison of two PCs you will see this one PC behaves differently and do I do an alarm hour or not but you know uh, the other PC will update probably in the afternoon, but at the end of Tuesday, at the end of the update day, both uh, PCs will again do the same stuff and run the same programs and behave identically. So, we as a human look at this graph and probably figure out is it doing the same? Yes, this is matching, and this is matching, and these blocks are matching. Probably it did the same. Um, if you look at the event counter, eight digits is doing a lot. And if you remember from this previous picture, even one peak, one excess could be actually the attack that happened. So in reality, we have a lot of excesses and we would have to match up the one system with the other system for a comparison to see whether one system behaved differently. Whether new processes started or processes that are already running started to behave differently. Uh, the messy real world looks very much identical. Here is something different, but the actual attack could be this peak, it could be not this peak. How did we approach this problem? Uh, what we actually want to do is we want to, uh, we cannot save or analyze, analyze all the millions of events. We need to throw information away, but at the same time we want to keep as much information uh, that we can figure out whether our two cases are happening or not. So new processes are starting or processes uh, behave differently. So we figured out a 
fingerprinting algorithm for that, which uh, compresses down the event information to what processes are starting what processes and what they are actually doing, uh, which gives us a tool or a data structure for the assessment for the assessment of the sameness of processes. So like, we can start to compare processes on this system with processes on the other system. If you want to know the details about this schema and how it works, there is was a paper published about this last year at Paris, uh, and you can look up what this actually means. But think, uh, think about it, we throw data away, we generate a fingerprint from the processes that are running, and these fingerprints are then easily com more easily comparable. Of course, it cannot be perfect. If we throw data away, we have to choose. And sometimes uh, we miss stuff, and sometimes the, in the fingerprint is the right stuff, with which, which is okay. So there's never a 100% solution. Uh, what we end up with is, if we take these fingerprints from one system and this process fingerprints from the other system, uh, an algorithm uh, can sort, pre-sort this for us. And the algorithm says, well, on one system was the process running, and the other, on the other system the process was also running, and it did exactly the identical stuff. This is probably not malware. A human da does not have to look at it. On the other end of the scale, we have a unique process on a system, only seen on this system, but nowhere else. Then the algorithm should say, hey, a human analyst, you maybe want to look at this, because this is new behavior. Maybe this is a model. Something is happening here, I don't understand it, I don't know what to do with it. And to then you have the, the different uh, cases in between, so identical process, events look quite similar, but are not identical. Processes look similar, because I think the activities, what he's doing is identical. The process looks similar, events are also quite similar. So these are the four cases which I marked here now in green where usually you don't have to think about it, it's a normal system behavior. Where it gets interesting is, it is the identical process, but on one system the process does a unique behavior. That's the thing we want to know about. And the process looks similar, he has related events, which you could say are the same, but some unique events. So the thing is, uh, the algorithm pre-sorts this for the human analyst. The human analyst cannot go through lots of processes and lots of events, but the algorithm saves a human analyst time to make a suggestion. If you want to invest your time to analyze this data, start here with these processes. And when you're done with these processes, go to this ones, and then to this ones. And if you're very bored and you don't have anything to do on Sunday, you can look at these also, but they're probably uninteresting. Um, the problem is, of course, how to show um, the ongoing state of a system to a human. Uh, by the colors, the colors suggest already, yeah, maybe we make a traffic sign. If the systems are in a good state, we make it show it green. And if there's something happening, make it red. And if there's something in between, make it yellow or orange. What, what does that mean? Should we come back in 10 minutes again and then it's green, everything's all right, and if after 10 minutes it's still in orange, what do we do, what do we do? Uh, so it's a real problem uh, to show the compressed data, the state information down into a dashboard like or in a display uh, so that the human can do something with the information. Um, we thought about this and that's one of the ways uh, we actually try to show this. So again, here on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is from 0% to 100%, so the percent of the processes running on the system. And then we classify it according to these uh, internal cases, and then we say what processes are probably okay, so that's the blue one here, and what percent of processes are suspicious and should be inspected by a human. And this is how a typical attack looks like. In the beginning, everything's all right. And all of in at the point in time, it jumps from 0% to you know, 5%, something like that. OK, 5% of processes on the system says the algorithm, 
they look something different, they look something new, somebody should look at this. And a little bit later in time, you always have small changes over time, but then you have a jump from 5% to 20%. Now, a human should really take a look at the system. Because in a short time period, a lot of changes, and there's no good reason for it, for example, a Windows update, or an administrator did something, or just a system running by itself, and then 15% of processes uh, change its classification, that's probably more. And this, was, this graph was really drawn from an attack, so the attacker tried first to log in, looked, yeah, this account is really working, I have shell access, mm, I'll come back later in the night, then some time passed, he logged in and then began looking around and starting programs. And then, of course, if you see this on the dashboard, ideally you just zoom in here, what processes did change uh, their state, what was called, and see the call sync sequence of the processes. Okay, let's assume, perfect, it works. It's good enough. If you want to put this into production, as a researcher, just quickly code it and it somehow works and write a paper about it and be done. We have the, uh, the publication is done, I don't care anymore about it. Uh, maybe on the university, we are on a flight uh, project and we are working with a company partner and the company partner is not happy with just a paper publication. Uh, so how to transition from prototype to beta production? Oh, it's broken. No, it's perfect. Um, we have to think about two things. Uh, it should be resistant to deliberately fudged data fields in the event data. So we are talking about attackers who are trying to break into the system. So we are thinking about they will really try, try, think and try everything to get control of the system and to disturb our data collector. The second thing is, of course, not just like in the lab, uh, we simulate the loads, but imagine there's a brute force scanner that tries really every exploit available on the system and tries to break in. You get a lot of events all of a sudden. If you run one of these uh, available open source scanner tools uh, for exploits, the spike in events you receive all of a sudden, your system has to handle this spike of data, of data traffic. So if your algorithm is uh, not linear, quadratic or exponential, it's bad. It's not ready for production. You don't have the time, you don't have the computational power. Uh, nice example. What is a file name? So we are recording what's, what happens on the system. File accessors, you have file names. Have you ever thought about what file names could be? Hello world, exe, my document, exe, copy of vxd1, copy2, copy3, so the standard file names. No, uh, modern systems can also use Unicode file names. And these are not the same amongst different operating systems, Mac, Linux, and Windows. And, I hope you can read this. Um, in Linux, file names are technically just strings of bytes and do not necessarily represent a valid UDF8 string. So on the Linux, file names are arrays of bytes. The kernel does not care what the file name is. It's an array of bytes to me. If you have a file name on the Windows, you have arrays of white jars, which are white jar is 16 bits. Uh, and um, things, since we can have more than 16 bit characters, so 65k characters are not enough, when they designed Windows initially, it was enough. But then they said, okay, one uh, 60 bit is not enough. You can also combine two 60 bit uh, white chars to another chart. And if you have a programming language, so this is a bug from Node.js that expects uh, proper UTF8 encoded strings, you have a conversion problem. Because if you are creative and you create a so-called surrogate pair of two 16-byte uh, characters and you create it in C directly and then you want to open it in a programming language that expects you to have eight strings there must be somewhere a converter between these broken 16-bit uh, characters 
to the UTF-8 string and all of a sudden you don't get access to the files anymore because someone in between did not do the conversion or does not know how to do the conversion because the surrogate pair is actually an illegal pair that should not exist. The security guys think about such things, but if you uh, expect an attacker, you have to think about such things. Um, the experimental uh, implementation of our prototype is about something like this. It's also a two years old picture. We have the security event collector that collects the event, then they end up in the database, then we do the analysis, then we have Python, Jupyter, and browser interface, whatever. How do we get the data from one module to the next module? If I ask a random programmer here in the room what would you use? I get probably an answer of here, yeah, you use uh, HTTP as transport, then you make a REST API and you send JSON files. Okay, easy to do, five, li five lines of code and we are done. Should now someone say, no, that's not secure, you don't should use HTTP, you, you should use HTTPS, you should encrypt it. And then guys say, oh no, we have to create a certificate here, a certificate there, and we have to verify the certificate chains and certificates expire, and we have to review the certificate. Do you really have? Yes, you have to, because it has to be secure in production. You never know what's in between. Uh, are we done with that? Security? Well, when you ingest data coming from the outside, or you offer a uh, a service API to the outside and you say, please send me a JSON file. Please take a moment to think about what your, your customers are. So this guy took uh, 15, 16 program languages and all the standard JSON parsers and fed them all the things which should be possible in the specification. And this is the result. The red one parser crashed, that's bad for security. If you can, can feed someone a JSON file and it crashes, uh, you don't want this, you usually have a security problem. But in other cases, you should also look into parsing should have succeeded but failed, parsing should have failed but succeeded, result undefined, parsing succeeded, result undefined, parsing failed. Uh, JSON is not JSON. If you're just sending internally JSON data from one point to the other, but if you have a collector on the internet and it sends the data to another service point on the internet and theoretically everybody could collect, connect to your service that accepts JSON, you maybe have a problem or not. Depends what you do with it as an implementation. Um, why is this so? Because JSON was uh, invented in 2002 by writing it on a business card. And the boldest design decision I made was to not put the version number on JSON files, so there's no mechanism for revising it. We're stuck with JSON, whatever it is, in its current form, that's it. Great for security. <laughs> then there was an uh, RFC for application mind type, ECMAScript, ECMAScript, whatever, whatever. The state of the art is 2017, RFC 8259. It adds two things. JSON must be encoded in UTF-8 and JSON that is done. Uh, uh, hey, wait a minute. JSON must be encoded in UTF-8. Okay, if we send these file names in a JSON document and someone previously had some A16 bit characters that may be junk that need to be converted to UTF-8 so we can embed it into a JSON document on the OCR. These are only the corner cases uh, IT security guys ask. Usually, you don't care about this. You program five lines and it works, and well, it works. If you don't want to use JSON in your data pipeline, what else do you use as an alternative? XML. Um, is XML more robust? So in 2016, uh, SO came in st uh, state of knowledge. 
uh, disguised in the survey on XML parser vulnerabilities and known attacks for XML in 2002, blah, 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 blah. Uh, large scale analysis of 30 different XML parsers and 6 different program managers, evaluation framework, uh, 17 different attacks. We found vulnerabilities in 66% of the default configuration of all tested parsers. Default configurations. So if you just take an XML library and just use it and don't care about anything, configuration and don't read the manual, that's a bad idea. The overview in the paper is something like this. So, Parson is vulnerable to some attack. No other attacks are in both ones, so that's what they figured out. And, star is certain prerequisites and otherwise default settings. Uh, so, I'm not telling you don't use JSON or don't use XML. What I'm telling you, think a moment what are your customers that are sending you the data? Are they potentially evil? And if yes, then look at the config from configuration of your JSON or XML parser and see whether you, for example, can limit recursion deep of the data structures, memory use, uh, variants of files, parsed, etc. etc. <coughs> uh, parsing data is hard, as uh, widely known. I don't know whether, whether you even read the security news uh, in 2017. Uh, Microsoft scanners, I mean, that was my uh, defender, silently searches incoming emails for malware. However, by scanning the malware, so you get the mail, it gets automatically scanned, and uh, it gets remote code execution on your computer, and you have to do nothing. In Windows, critical, 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 basically all available versions of Windows. So parsing data, doing it in a safe way, don't have memory problems, doing it correctly, even the large companies are struggling. Be careful from where you accept data. Um, so I thought about this problem. Um, how do we get data from someone? And still, reasonably, you can say it's secure or not secure. Surely somebody must have thought about this already. Uh, I found this paper that's called Writing Parsers Like It's 2017. Um, and it says if a parser is written in C, it has memory corruption, buffer overflow, use after free, tower free, etc. etc. Usually, and uh, he was thinking about it how can we do this better? Um, and he tried it to rewrite it in Rust as a programming language. And also motivated from the real C media player parsing, if you know it, we'll see. We'll see as a media player has to accept audio files, video files from everywhere on the internet. And parsing these audio and video files is complicated stuff. And it should be done without crashing and robust and whatever. And he thought, well, if we accept data from somewhere, maybe we can write a parser in Rust. Why Rust? Uh, Rust is a system to program the language that runs blazingly fast, prevents sec faults, guarantees threat safety, and all great stuff. So if you look at the homepage, I want that. I want safety, I want speed, I want everything. <laughs> Looks great, right? Uh, in reality, why uh, did uh, Rust receive such a hype? In the end of 2017, the Firefox web browser got significant, significantly faster from one release to the next release. And why was that? Because they changed the CSS layout engine from single thread to multi threaded and how did they do this? There were two previous attempts to parallelize this uh, layout engine in C++ to rewrite it. So these two rewrite attempts in C++ failed. And then they did it again in Rust and they succeeded and they replaced 160,000 lines of C++ code with 85,000 lines of Rust code. And it now runs more stable and in parallel and with less memory bugs, etc. There is also a blog post on Mozilla homepage from 2019 where they uh, look back what what er classes of errors have been prevented. So looking over the time of the project, which are no now non-existing because they are replacing component by component of Firefox, the old C++ code with Rust code. What this has to do with our uh, work? So I thought, well, uh, 
let's try this. Uh, you see the good times always come on the weekend. Uh, I took a part of our algorithm in Python and rewrote it in Rust and see how this stuff is working. And now I get the standalone executor of six, six megabytes instead of an anaconda installation of I don't know what size. Uh, but basically it connects to the database and runs some checks and it gets me 42,000 events from the database, whatever my algorithm is doing. Uh, the speed of the algorithm uh, was limited by the uh, database speed that's Postgres here and no longer by the program language speed which was previous, previously Python. Uh, from the robustness and portability point, I then thought, well, Rust is also a for an ARM. Can we recombine this? I tried it again on the old droid, something like a Raspberry, but a little bit more expensive, but also a little bit more powerful, so more fun than a Raspberry. Uh, two and a half inch disk. Basically, it's a recombine. You get an execute every you run it. It works the same. It's slower uh, because it's the ARM processor is uh, slower than the PC processor. But it worked basically the same, I get the same results back. And for the more advanced version, uh, can we push this even further? I, before uh, Christmas, there was also the release for Tamux, which is a uh, Linux like environment for Android phones. I recompiled it, uh, you connect it to the database. It looks, takes 4 minutes, 44 seconds, uh, not because of the processor, but the wireless connection speed to the data, uh, database was not fast enough. So the Wi-Fi was the limit. To be continued, uh, at this point I am stopping here because we have a paper at submission at the conference <coughs> with the more interesting results, so I cannot show this to you yet. Maybe I am getting invited back at, in autumn. I can tell you something more. We are currently working in the target project to bring this algorithm really into the product, to deploy it to real customers, and hopefully it holds up under real world tax scenarios. If you uh, listen, thank you for your listening. Uh, I hope you learned something. Uh, and if it's only in the beginning you have a simple research question, and then over time, within such a problem, project, you figure out you have a data collection problem, and then you have a data processing problem, and you also have a privacy problem, and then you have all these interesting features, encoding, extraction, fingerprinting problem, then you have your prototype implementation problem, and then you have to engineer this also, that uh, the algorithm not only works in the lab, but also in production, uh, on the security and robustness, which you really, really want if you want to sell this and deploy this into real world. Uh, thank you for your attention. Feedback welcome, either now or by mail. Uh, our research, inst uh, research institute has an important homepage. Institute for Security Research, where also the US Press Center is located, and our company, Partner CyberTrap. If you want to do uh, a start, it is ending next year. We are searching for new projects now. If if you want to do a research project as a company or have interesting problems, or want to do other uh, interesting cooperation with us, you're welcome.